Welcome to ETF Edge, your go-to place for everything exchange traded funds. I am your host, Bob Pisani. The S&P 500 bottomed two years ago and is at an historic high. Not so with the small cap Russell 2000. It's still almost 9% from its historic high. And some frustrated small cap investors are looking for actively managed alternatives to small caps. Let's talk with Rob Harvey, Vice President of Dimensional Funds. Ben Slavin is the global head of ETFs for BNY Mellon. And, and Rob, including 2024, the S&P has outperformed the Russell 2000 12 of the last 15 years. I know at Dimensional, you believe you can get some outperformance by using a profitability overlay. Explain what you guys do and why you think a profitability overlay is important. Yeah, that's right. So we're starting from a still a very well diversified group of small cap securities but you can refine that investment universe a little bit. There's no reason to hold companies that really are scraping the bottom of the barrel in terms of profitability, dragging down in returns historically as well. You remove those from your small cap universe, you can do a lot for boosting returns. And so when you look at some of our products that we have at Dimensional, comparing those to commercial indices that don't have those refinements, it's a night and day difference when you look at the small cap. And when premium. you say night and day, I mean, you're talking, you can get what, one, two percentage over time outperformance? You're not talking about massive outperformance compared to like the Russell 2000, are you? Or what, what kind of outperformance are we talking about? Well, when we look at DFAS, which has been around since 1999, we see that it's not only outperformed the Russell 2000 by a substantial margin. On a net of fees basis, it's also outperformed the S&P 500 and the Russell 3000 by almost 1%. So now you're really starting to see that small cap premium pop up but you don't get that if you don't have those refinements to your investment universe. So it's really something that attracts investors right. to a dimensional way of thinking about investing. Ben, ben uh, we all know about the academic research. Uh, it's long supported the notion that over long periods of time, small caps outperform, large caps value outperforms growth, but that's not happened on any consistent basis in over 15 years. Can you just give us a riff on this? Why is this happening? Uh, and is adding a profitability overlay, as Rob suggests, actually helpful? You're exactly right. The academic research has been out there for quite a long time. What's changed is the number of products that are in the market that allow investors not only to provide some kind of a factor tilt, but also even more active stock picking product as well. And also the issuers have done quite a good job over the last several years really educating investors on how these factors can um, be used inside their asset allocation models, inside their portfolios. And many of these products, as you just mentioned, have track records which investors can use to you know, really analyze how this would look on a risk adjusted basis. But clearly investor sentiment has shifted towards small caps and you can see that in the numbers in terms of where investors are putting their dollars from a flow standpoint and these type of strategies are benefiting. Yeah, you know, a lot of people, I'm, I want to get to the why of this a little bit. Uh, many people blame the composition of the Russell 2000 which is very heavily weighted as you both know towards small cap bank stocks and biotechs, uh, most of which are, are, are unprofitable. So, you know, if you look at that, I don't know if we, we can put up uh, my, my full screen here about the composition of the Russell 2000, but uh, you look at it here, 25% are financials, 15% are, are healthcare. Uh, look, health technology here, that's biotech, by the way. Uh, you can see what the, the, the impact is. Tech is only 10%, that's a, that's a tiny portion compared to the S&P 500 technology sector here. So I'm trying to get a why is this happening? Why are we getting this persistent underperformance? And I think it's because of the unprofitability of some of the core sectors here like financials and health technology. I mean, that's a big part of it too. When you look at these sectors as well, they happen to be in the growth side of the market, which means investors are ready to pay a lot to obtain these companies that don't have a lot of profit. So it's kind of a double whammy going against these companies. When you exclude those again, then you really start to see you can still have diversification across sectors, but you're not holding on to these securities that really drag down in returns. Yeah, so let, let's talk about, I have a little full screen here of potential factors in small cap underperformance. So we talked about tech dominance, you could, as you mentioned, the growth aspect. Investors are buying growthier parts of the market, number one. Uh, lower profit margins come up too. Uh, you know, the, the small caps have lower profit margins, but I think probably because Big cap is dominated by growth, uh, which have higher profit margins. Um, some people will point out higher interest rates have been a factor that small caps are more sensitive to higher interest rates. That obviously interest rates have come down the last two years. Um, and some people point up to inflation, that small companies lack the pricing power uh, of, of larger firms. I'm trying to figure out, give the viewers an answer about this underperformance because 
I think many of them are just baffled about it. Um, uh, and I, I, I think the simplest answer is the tech dominance. Investors seem to prefer growthier parts of the market. What about this idea that passive investing is a problem? <laughs> Let's go blame ETFs, okay? These passive investors are buying the S&P 500 reflexively without thinking about it, and that has a growth overlay to it, and therefore it's making it much more difficult for value investors to make. We've had big hedge fund managers come on and say this. It's not the same as value used to be. 20 years ago, if I thought a stock was worth it was $10 and I thought it was worth $12 and I waited two years, I'd be rewarded. And now I'm not being rewarded the same. And it's got to be those passive investors. Yeah, ah, the passive active debate and the growth versus value debate all wrapped up into one. I think, look, from a, you know, a small cap perspective, again, ETFs give investors that choice. And so you see even on the small cap passive benchmarks, you can go value, you can go growth. Now, of course, growth even in the small cap space is outperforming this year. Um, and certainly we've seen that sentiment play out. You know, we'll see what happens through the rest of the year. Um, that gap has significantly narrowed, but still it does allow investors that choice. And again, even with the factor based, whether it be profitability or others, it gives investors a quick way to gain that exposure, you know, given how they want to approach the market. And um, there's just lots of options out there uh, for investors and to do so with liquidity and, and cheaply as well. Yeah, and um, you know, there, I want to note that there's other small cap ETFs out there that screen for profitability. Uh, I know the Spider S&P small cap 600 ETF, the symbol is SPSM. Th they do exactly that. Now, they have a very specific rules base here. In, in, the, in the Spider one, it screens for positive gap earnings, generally accepted accounting principle earnings, yeah. for the past 12 months. So you have to have positive earnings for the past 12 months and in the most recent quarter uh, on top of liquidity. How does that compare to your approach? You have a rules-based approach to doing this too, right? We do too. I mean, we think about profitability in a little bit of a different way. A big difference between us and a commercial index though is how often is your index looking at the profitabilities of the companies that are constituents? For us, that answer is every day, which means that as financials are coming out to light, right, you have reported earnings every single day for all kinds of different companies, you want your investment universe to reflect that information. You want your investment universe to be refined for that. In a commercial index, you're looking at maybe once, four times a year, usually at most, where there's going to be changes made. Really, what we've seen is, when you have these premiums show up, they can be quick and they can be powerful. Like what we saw, for example, in July of this year. Phenomenally strong period for small caps, right? You see the same thing for profitability and value as well. It can happen quickly and in large magnitude. So by having that daily process to really focus on, you know, making sure that you're getting those premiums, that can be the difference between a great investment experience and just an okay one. I'm trying to get at, and I know I'm belaboring this, about why the underperformance is so strong, but it's got to be related to the fact that 40% of the companies in the S&P 500 are unprofitable. I'm sorry, 40% of the companies in the Russell 2000 are unprofitable. That's not the case with the S&P 500 at all. That's not even close to that number. So can we talk about why this unprofitability has been occurring for a long time. It wasn't that way 20 years ago. It wasn't that bad. Um, I don't know, I'm trying to look it up now. I don't know the exact number it was 20 years ago, but 40% of the Russell 2000 was not unprofitable 20 years ago. So there's a whole, there's a sludge here of companies that are consistently unprofitable that I think are weighing down, is weighing down the Russell that doesn't happen with the S&P 500 for some reason. Yeah, that's true, but I do also think you have to think about, well, what are you holding when you invest in micro caps and small caps? You know, these are companies that are very early on in the stages of their life cycle. There's lots of room to grow into becoming more profitable companies as well. So we don't necessarily anticipate that companies have to be massively profitable right off the gates. That's one of the reasons that people are attracted to things like private equity or small cap investing, right? So you do have a part of the universe that has lower profitability, you can screen out for that, um, and that by itself is enough to boost returns. Yeah, so we have about 40% that are unprofitable, right? Um, weeding out unprofitable companies is a form of active management, right? I would, I would think so, even if it's done in a rules-based fashion like you have. Yeah. Would this approach, weeding, using profitability as a factor, also work in large caps? Yes, for, from you do our this with the S&P 500. Right, from our perspective, thinking about 
the impact that a solid income statement has on large cap companies is very similar to what you see in small cap companies, right? It matters to have profitability. And so over longer periods of time across sectors and geographies and securities, it tends to be the case that having that profitability emphasis in your portfolio is helpful. In 2021, 15% of the S&P 500 companies were unprofitable. So it's a big difference, 15 versus uh, 40% being unprofitable. So uh, this factor de it, debate has been around for a long time. The original factor was just beta. Out, yeah. you, know, you had to take risk. Yeah. Higher beta stocks tended to outperform because they had more risk. Then Fama French came along and we had the two-factor model, which was small caps tend to outperform big caps value tends to outperform growth. And we've added other factors as time goes on. We profitability factor. This is all gets wrapped up in this quality uh, issue. There's a momentum factor as well. Yep. Um, how much should investors be paying attention to these different factors? We're, we're essentially talking about paying attention to one of them, profitability here. Do, 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 does this actually matter in terms of outperformance? Along Absolutely it does. And by the way, the factors that we're talking about are not mutually exclusive. In fact, when you combine those factors together, you know, value with profitability, for example, even in periods of time where you see value not performing great, like we've seen in the US over the last couple of years, if profitability is doing well, you're diversified inside of your strategy, even to the factor exposure that you have. So making sure that you have a manager and have selected that manager based off of how they're integrating these premiums is also very important. Yeah, I, I guess the question is what, what should it, the average investor do? I mean, viewers are smart enough. I, they, they message me or stop in the street and say, I, I know we should have a diversified portfolio. I can't just own the S&P 500. That's not diversified. I'm, I need to have some small cap exposure. I need to have international exposure. I need to have some bond exposure. But Bob, look at this yep. thing. Look at the Russell for 15 years. Yep. Well, we do see um, some of that changing as well. So certain investors are doing exactly what Rob just mentioned, where they're looking at products or combination of factors to try to generate some kind of an outcome, um, whether that be alpha or at least on a risk adjusted basis, depending on their goals. And then again, back to this story around active, Bob, we do see investors starting to choose actively managed product for exactly these reasons because they're, they are unsure. And we've seen flows go to both. I think it's more pronounced in the small cap space in these less efficient markets where these factor combinations can offer right. you know, a stronger tilt or provide you know, some kind of an active managed overlay, which again, investors are right. betting that it's going to receive some type of but alpha compared to, to large cap, but those are, those are picking up uh, you know, flow as well. You seem to be saying though, that diversification still matters. I mean, we're, we've been debating about why small, so many small cap stocks are unprofitable. I guess, th does it mean, it doesn't mean investors should reduce their allocation to small caps, right? I mean, we, the, the diversity story is still very real, right? Absolutely, look, if you ask most investors, what would you have wanted to hold more of over the course of the last year? They're going to tell you NVIDIA, right? That's the stock that everybody thinks about. NVIDIA isn't even in the top 40 uh, top performing names in the Russell 3000 through the first three quarters of this year. Where did the rest of those names come from? Small caps, micro caps, right? That's the power of diversification is that you get to pick up these securities that are doubling, tripling in value even over a couple of months you probably haven't heard of those before. That's a good thing. That's why you want to have well-diversified portfolio. And you, you the master of flows, uh, BNY Mellon, you watch all of that stuff uh, incessantly. Are, are investors coming to believe this? Are there actually flows into any small cap? There, there are. I, I, you had flows to this year, right? We did. Rob Dimensionals yeah. had flows? Yeah, absolutely. Flows. Yeah, w I mean, clearly the numbers are also showing that as well. Yes, the flow data is showing that. I think what's also really interesting is that it's not just simply flows, but we see these products being added to asset allocation models, specifically in the wealth channel, most notably in the RIA market, who are starting to add more small caps and do so via active management. In fact, around two thirds of the flow that we've seen this year, based on our data, uh, shows that um, it's active that's being added to those models. So it's really a change from what we've seen even uh, in the past year or so uh, from where we are today. Investors seem to be believing this profitability overlay. So DFAS, which is yours, has had inflows this year. Yep. That means investors are putting money in above and beyond any price changes, folks. That's what it means. Their shares are being created. Um, IJR, which is the uh, iShares small cap ETF, that has a profitability overlay. Uh, we already mentioned the Spider 
uh, S&P small cap, SPSM, that's had inflows as well. So um, somebody's believing this, although as you mentioned earlier, the whole market's getting inflows to a certain extent. Yeah, I mean, everything seems to be benefiting from an ETF standpoint this year, just given the overall flow picture. I mean, again, we're at a record year this year. Um, so again, everything is benefiting, um, at least from a structural standpoint, we see that money again continuing to come out of mutual funds into the ETF wrapper. And obviously markets have a big, uh, you know, a big part in this as well, given what's happening uh, with the broader market and specifically small caps, obviously. So you get the point here, folks. We're trying to figure out why small caps have been underperforming, but even above and beyond that, nobody's arguing against diversification. Everyone is saying you have to still continue to stay diversified, but investors are looking for choices other than investing in simple market capitalization. And one is to look at that profitability overlay, which is one of the things Dimensional and other people are doing. That's why we have them on, folks, the best in the business. That does it for this week's ETF Edge. My thanks to Rob and Ben. We've asked Ben to stick around and provide us additional perspective on this record year of inflows for ETFs and what might happen in the final months of the year. And remember, you can see all of our shows. They're on our website, etfedge.cnbc.com. Everybody have a healthy, happy, and safe trading week. Get the ABCs of ETFs with the ETF Edge newsletter. Your weekly update on the hottest trends, expert analysis, actionable ideas, and exclusive insight from host Bob Fasani. Sign up now at cnbc.com forward slash ETF Edge newsletter.